What's going on YouTube? RDAP Dan here, Federal Prison Time Consulting. Hope you guys are all having an amazing day so far. Today we're going to be talking about the top 10 things that you should be doing prior to going into federal prison. So if you're getting ready to prepare to self-surrender, you want to know what your first couple of days are going to be like, you have all this overwhelming fear and anxiety of what to expect, Today in this video, the top 10 coming at you. But before we jump into this video, take a quick moment, subscribe to our channel, hit the bell in the top right hand corner of your screen. If you're on your computer, this will turn on your notifications to make sure that you receive videos when we post them. Also, don't forget to text the word YouTube to 76626. This will put you on our text messaging notification list so you don't miss any of our live streams or pre recorded videos. And if you haven't done so, hit the thumbs up and make sure you like this video and share this video with anybody that you think might be going through a very stressful period in their life. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into number one on our checklist as what you should do prior to self-surrendering to federal prison. Number one, you need to be at peace in your current situation. So being at peace with the situation, with the fact that many of you took a plea deal, you're getting ready to go to prison, you don't know what to expect, but you're at peace with it. That's definitely going to be tip number one. You have to be at peace. Number two, having your finances in proper order. So properly preparing your financial situation for going into prison. You need to decide what your budget is going to be for what you're spending while you're in prison. You have things like commissary. You have things like phone. You have things like the computer for your email stamps, maybe a little bit of medicine. If you're trying to get some Advil or Benadryl to help you sleep at night, these are all things that you can purchase on commissary. Then you have things like your clothes, your sneakers, your MP3 player, a lot of the one-time purchases that you're going to purchase not so often, different condiments, whether it be ketchup and mustard, mayonnaise. These are all things that you want to think about that you're going to be purchasing on commissary. Then you also have your phone, you have your email, all of this is going to come out of your budget and what you allocate yourself for. Now, many of you are asking questions right now. Well, you're only allowed to spend three to $400 a month, depending what prison you're at. When you have those limits on what you're allowed to spend, what they're talking about is mostly items on the actual commissary list, food, coffee, clothes, MP3 players. You can't spend more than 300 to $400 a month on those type of items. But when you're talking about your phone, internet, hygiene products, stamps, things like that, there's no limit on how much you can spend. So you can spend an additional three or $400 a month if you wanted to on purchasing stamps, purchasing minutes for the phone, purchasing minutes on the computer. You know, phone can easily run you anywhere from 20 to $60 a month, depending on whether or not you're just using uh, the regular long distance service that the prison offers. Meaning if you go to prison, you call home, you're going to be calling a long distance call. That 15 minute phone call is going to cost you $3.15. You can do things like get yourself a Google voice number that has the same area code as the prison. You would have that number forwarded to the person that you're going to be calling the most, more than likely your loved one, your wife, your husband, your child. And when you dial that number, now that you're dialing a local number, instead of charging you the $3.15 per minute, that same phone call ends up costing you about 90 cents per minute, which can be quite a savings over the period of time, depending on how long you're in prison. And remember, you only have 300 minutes per month. So if you think you're going to make a bunch of phone calls every single day, you'll be able to do that for about a week. And then you'll be out of minutes for the rest of the month until your minutes reset on whatever day of the month that you start. So to budget your time properly to be able to make phone calls on a regular basis, my advice to you and I get it when you first get there, you're going to be a little overwhelmed. So you might make a few extra phone calls more than normal. But once you go into a routine, if you make one phone call every other day, you'll be able to use the phone all month long without going too long, without being able to use it. Holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, things like that. Uh, you get an extra hundred minutes per month. So that would give you 400 minutes per month versus the 300. So you can get a little more bang for your buck during the holidays to talk to some additional family members. Computer and the emails, that's pretty much unlimited. It's limited to 30 minutes at a time, meaning you can get on the computer, you can send, receive emails for 30 minutes, and then you have to get off the computer. I believe it's for 15 minutes and then you can get back on again. You can do that as much as you want. When you're logged into the email system, you're spending five cents per minute. 
So it doesn't sound like a lot, but that can rack up pretty quick. So you wanna keep track of how much you're spending, how much you think you're gonna spend, and you really wanna properly prepare for this budget. Not everybody has an unlimited piggy bank where they can tap into. Realistically, to live comfortably in prison, I would say the average person is probably gonna be spending somewhere between $300 and $600 per month. That's gonna be your food and then all of your add-ons, whether it be phone, email, getting stamps to mail out letters, all of this stuff costs money. So you wanna make sure that your friends and family understand how to put money onto your books. There's actually a link in the description of this video. We did a video several months ago on how to send a loved one money through Western Union online. Uh, it's a very easy process. If you don't take the time to watch the video, I promise you, you can figure it out. But there's a link in the description of this video to show you how to send money to a loved one so you can understand the process now before you go. But budgeting for commissary, budgeting what it's gonna cost you while you're in prison, if you start taking that serious now, you'll be able to start setting money aside so this doesn't become an extra burden on your friends and family while you're away. Tip number three, expanding your mind from the inside. You're in prison, you're in an undesirable environment, you're somewhere you do not wanna be, you did everything you can do to not have to go, but here you are. So how do you decide to expand your mind while you're in prison? This actually starts before you go to prison. One of the biggest things to do in prison, other than work out, take classes, is read. Reading can really, A, kill a lot of time, and it can really build a lot of value in your mind and set you in a new positive direction that can create positive outcomes life after prison. How you do that before you land yourself in prison is you log into your Amazon account or start an Amazon account, find a bunch of books that you think you'd be interested in reading, put these books in your shopping cart or on your wish list, make sure a friend or a family member or a relative of sorts has the ability to log in to your Amazon cart, and they can, from time to time, send you some of the items in your cart, whether you're reading one book a week, two books a week. This is a way that you can predetermine what books you're going to want to read. Once you're in prison, you got to remember, you don't have easy access to go Google what is a good read? What is something that's gonna free my mind? You can start Googling all of those questions right now, or maybe there's one or two books that you've read in the past and you wanna read books that are like-minded. Uh, you wanna remember what you plan on doing with your time in prison. So if you're in a point where you're trying to come up with new habits, you wanna redefine a little bit of who you are, you really wanna determine what type of lifestyle you wanna have in prison. If you want a positive lifestyle where you're in prison, you want to better yourself, you want to put yourself into a better situation, you want to be better than you are when you went into prison, I would suggest finding books that are going to enlighten you, that are going to take you to that next step, that are going to challenge your thoughts. Or you can just read books that are going to be entertaining or violent. You know, it, it really depends on your taste. But I can tell you the people that I've seen thrive in prison, these are people that read books. When they're done reading the books, they'll almost do a book report on them. They'll ask themselves, why do they read this book? What do they get out of this book? And they'll make notes because these notes later on is going to give you great content for where your mind was while you were in prison. And when you're out of prison sometime in the future, which most of you will be, you're going to find yourself maybe thinking about some of your old ways and going back to some of your notes, remembering some of the books that you read, remembering the value that it had, the impact that it had on you. It can really go a long way with creating the person you want to be while you're in prison. Tip number four, record your experience from the inside. No, I'm not saying get a cell phone or some kind of a recording device. We see people do that all the time and they end up in the shoe. So definitely don't do that. However, recording your experience in prison is simple. You have the ability to write letters. You have the ability to blog. You have the ability to journal while you're in prison. Doing all of this is gonna allow you to create a real-time timestamp of what your mindset is, what you're going through, people that you're meeting. I suggest going to commissary every week and when you purchase all of your food and all of your goodies, you can also purchase what's called picture tickets. Picture tickets will allow you to go to the rec yard, usually during the weekends or when you go to visitation, and you can actually get pictures taken while you're there. Having pictures taken of yourself, showing progress, maybe you're going through an exercise transformation, Maybe you've met some really interesting people that you don't want to forget. I strongly suggest document everything you do in prison because you don't know what type of value it's going to have later on in life. So documenting your journey, recording your experiences now, 
I promise you will be extremely beneficial on whatever you decide to do in the future. Take the time, write down your notes, spend a little bit each day writing. While I was in prison, I decided to write a letter every single day. I would write a letter either to myself, I would sometimes title it Dear Future Dan, or I would write a letter to Shelly, or I'd write letters to my children. But I'd write a letter every single day. And some days I didn't feel like writing, some days I didn't know what to write about. But once I would start putting pen to paper, all of your daily activities would start coming through your mind and you, you would start remembering. Uh, a lot of people go to prison and they say, when I get out of prison, I don't want to remember any of this. I want to put this behind me. I'm going to throw everything away. I don't want to bring anything from prison to the free world with me. You got to remember that this is an experience that you're going through. And when you're going through it, you think you're never going to forget the people you meet. You think these are people that you're going to remember for the rest of your life. Or you think these might be people that you're going to reconnect with after prison. And maybe you will, but the average person does not. And not only do they not do that, they forget everything from their prison experience. The main reason why you forget everything in prison is every day is a very repetitive day for the most part. You're getting up, same environment, same faces, same food. It's very routine and what happens is it creates this, this cycle of almost like a groundhog day where because every day is exactly the same, it becomes one giant long day. And once you're released from prison, you start doing so many different things. You're in the halfway house, you're in home confinement, you're looking for a job, you're paying bills. It immediately replaces that one giant memory with all of the new things that you're now going through. And after three months to six months, prison becomes a very, very distant memory. Even for somebody like me who relives my prison experience day in and day out doing YouTube channels and talking to individuals getting ready to go into prison, I still find myself struggling to remember people's names, people's faces. I'll go back and read some of my letters and it brings back memories that I would never remember otherwise. So take the time, build value into what you're doing. Don't make this something that you want to forget about. Don't make this a bad memory. You're going to prison for a reason. You allowed yourself to make some poor choices. The last thing you want to do is forget what that experience felt like while you're there. You got to find something to bring home with you to keep you rooted. So if you do decide to have a poor thought or thinking about making a poor choice in the future, you can go back to this experience and remember what you had to go through to get to where you are right now in the future. Writing down your experiences, journaling this information is probably going to be the single best way. Tip number five. What can you and what should you bring when you self-surrender to federal prison? This is the question that we get probably more than any other question surrounding the thought of self-surrendering. So let's kind of talk about the basics first. Everybody wants to know, can I bring my own shoes? Can I bring my own clothes? Some prison camps and maybe some lows will let you bring in your own tennis shoes. Prior to just going out and getting a pair of shoes, I highly suggest if you're not one of our clients that you contact the prison and ask the prison directly, if you are allowed to bring in your own shoes, what do they want those shoes to look like? They're probably going to want a certain color. Uh, they may give you some specifics. They may not want them to be over a certain price. The last thing they want you to do is be able to bring in a pair of shoes that are worth several hundreds of dollars and you go trade them on the compound where it becomes a currency. So bringing in your own shoes is a possibility. Most prisons do not allow it. However, commissary does sell shoes, so fear not, you'll be able to buy tennis shoes. Other things that you can definitely bring with you if you are married and you wanna bring in a wedding ring, just remember the wedding ring can't have any jewelry attached to it, no gemstones. It's supposed to be under a $100 value. They're probably not gonna ask you to see your receipt, but you definitely don't wanna walk in there with an expensive ring on. Leave your expensive wedding ring at home maybe go to the store like Walmart or something and just buy a cheap brass or stainless steel wedding band just as a symbol of your love for your wife or your husband and wear that in. You're allowed to wear a religious necklace of your liking. Again, it needs to be under $100 value. They don't want you to be able to use that and trade it as currency on the compound. You can wear a pair of glasses in there. If you have prescription glasses, make sure you bring a copy of your prescription. Again, you don't wanna go out and get super expensive frames. One, A, they're probably gonna get broken at some point, or two, they're possibly going to get stolen. And number three, again, it could be considered something that could be traded on the compound for a high-end level of currency. So you wanna get yourself a nice cheap metal frame or plastic frame. That's what you wanna wear in. If you do break your glasses, you can buy frames on commissary. They're pretty hideous, big black plastic glasses. So maybe have a couple of backup pair that you have at home that you can have mailed in. This is definitely something 
that I strongly suggest if you need to wear glasses. Uh, most prisons are not equipped to handle contacts. So if you wear contacts, more than likely you're not gonna be able to wear your contacts into prison. So you wanna make sure you have a pair of prescription glasses going in, especially if you wanna walk the track or play any sports. And that can definitely be a hindrance. I know a lot of you right now are thinking, oh my God, I need to wear my contacts. Well, you're going to prison, you don't have that luxury, so move on and get over it and figure out what you're gonna do about it ASAP. Hearing aids, most prisons are equipped to handle some level of hearing aid equipment. Some of you have very, very high-tech equipment. I don't know that it's going to be able to be maintained in your regular average prison camp. So again, you're gonna to wanna to contact the prison, find out as much information as you can. If you're one of our clients, we're more than happy to make that call for you. You can also bring in what we call a master contact list. And your contact list is going to be friends, family, your attorney, whoever it is that you feel like you may need to be in contact with on some sort of a regular basis. And on this contact list, you're going to need their full name, mailing address, email address, and phone number. You're going to need all of that information to put them into your computer system in federal prison, which is CoreLinks. CoreLinks is the inmate email system. That's what you use to send emails. That's what you receive your emails on. So make sure you have that information on a piece of paper when you walk in. If for some reason the correctional staff does not allow you to bring this into the prison, make sure at least one of those contacts on that list you have completely memorized. So when you get in, you can add that person's information, you can email them and make sure that person also has a copy of your master list to where they can copy and paste it in the body of an email and send it to you so you can get access to that list once you arrive in prison. You wanna make sure whoever your point of contact is on the outside is well equipped, that they have a game plan for what's gonna happen if they can't get a hold of you, if you're not able to get access to phones right away. You wanna prep them as much as you can to let them know that your first couple of days, you may not have access to the phone, you may not have access to commissary. So you wanna have a plan as to where, what happens if it goes beyond that. Maybe your paperwork wasn't transferred to the prison. Maybe you got sent to solitary confinement because your paperwork wasn't updated. So contacting the prison ahead of time to make sure that your paperwork is at the prison, meaning your PSR, your judgment of committal. You wanna make sure that information has been updated in the prison system so you don't have to sit any longer than necessary. Now, don't freak out. A lot of you are just heard that and you're thinking, oh my God, what if the prison doesn't have my paperwork? I can tell you in all of the time that I've been doing this, I have not had one individual tell me their paperwork wasn't there and they had to sit in the shoe. So it shouldn't be something that you're too concerned about. Some other things that you definitely want to bring when you self-surrender to federal prison is your driver's license a copy of your social security card. If you don't have your social security card right now, take the time, go get a replacement, jump through some hoops because it's much easier to do now than it is once you're in federal prison. So your driver's license, a copy of your social security card, proof of high school transcripts or GED. You wanna show proof that you graduated high school. They are not automatically gonna know that. And if you get to prison and they can't validate that easily, there's a good chance they will put you in a GED class. You'll also be prevented from taking other certain classes without having proof of a GED. So you may be in there with a master's degree, but because you didn't bring that with you, you're sitting in a GED class for several days up to several weeks until that information gets validated and supplied to the prison. So bring in your transcripts with you. Also, every single one of you that has been sentenced had to pay a special assessment fee of at least $100 possibly more depending on how many charges you, you pled guilty to. You need to get a receipt for the special assessments that you paid. If you go into prison without the receipt for these special assessments, there is a very high probability that they would put you on FRP, which is financial responsibility payments. They will put you on this, which again, you'll be prevented from a lot of the programming and it's a pain in the butt. They'll start taking money off of your commissary until you've proven that you've paid this. And they wanna see this through the form of a receipt. So if you already paid your special assessment and you do not have a receipt, all you need to do is call the clerk's office of the federal courthouse where you were sentenced, call them, and if it's local, just go ahead and drive there and ask for a copy of it. If it's too far to drive, call them up, ask them what you can do to get a copy of your receipt. You can probably log in if you paid it with a credit card, you may be able to pull it off of your bank statement. Point is, is you wanna get a copy of this receipt and bring it with you upon self-surrendering. I've seen people that have gotten dragged through the mud over things like this 
And you would think the Bureau of Prisons would have this on their website with a list of things to bring with you because these are things that they ask from everybody when entering into the system. So those are a few things that you wanna bring. So that was number five and number six together. I kind of combined those together because the two really go hand in hand. Tip number seven, reshaping your destiny. Who were you prior to this event? Who are you currently right now? And who do you see yourself being at the end of all of this? You need to ask yourself a lot of hard questions like what would you do differently if you had the opportunity to do this all over again? These are things that you should be writing down right now or maybe coming back to this video and taking some notes on this section. But asking yourself what you would do differently if given the opportunity over. Asking yourself, what are your current character flaws? What are things that you're not happy about in life? What are some things that you could see yourself improving? And you need to ask these questions. Maybe ask some of your friends and family. Ask for some real feedback. Ask them, what do they see as character flaws? What do they see things in your life that you could work to improve on? Being willing to be open-minded to other people's feedback right now. This is some questions that you could really ask yourself that you can work on while you're in prison. Asking yourself, what are your immediate goals? And what are you actually doing to make these goals come to life? Holding yourself accountable, pointing out your flaws, which we already spoke about, telling your peers, people that you're gonna be surrounding yourself around, whether it's your friends and family right now while you're still out in the free world, once you arrive into prison, people that you start spending time with and you feel comfortable with, tell them what your goals are and what you wanna to do to hold yourself accountable and ask them if you see me slipping or you see me falling back to some of my old ways, tell them what your triggers are. Tell them some of the things that you used to do to whether it was getting over on people, whether you were a manipulator, whether you thought you had all of the answers. Whatever your situation was, identify it and tell other people what it is because this makes it real. And if you encourage them to say, hey, if you see me making these mistakes or you see me falling back, point it out to me because maybe I don't realize it's happening. Maybe I'm getting so comfortable or so complacent on slipping back to my old ways again. And having individuals around you that are willing to lift you up and hold you accountable can be a little frustrating at first. It can be a trial and error process because it's something that you're not completely used to. But in the end, it's gonna help you create these short-term goals or gonna move into long-term goals that are gonna create new habits and rituals, which is the whole point that you're going through this to return home to be the person that you want to be. If you think you've got it all figured out and you're perfect right now and just because you've gone through this pre-trial experience, there's no more growth, you've learned everything you need to learn, you're probably still learning and you're probably not ready to make those final decisions yet. So allow yourself to continue to grow, to continue to absorb. A lot of you that are going through this experience right now that are used to either running the show or you're, you're a high-end white collar individual, you're putting yourself into an environment where you're gonna be an equal playing field and allowing yourself to get this humbling experience and understanding you can learn something from people you never would have given a second look if you were not in this situation can be one of the most beautiful gifts that you're getting from this entire experience. Tip number eight, healthy relationships, and more importantly, building and forging healthy relationships. You're getting ready to go into prison. Your mindset is all over the place. For many of you, you're at an all-time low. You think life is never gonna be the same. You're embarrassed, you're ashamed. You feel like, I'm not gonna be able to find a job after this, or maybe I'm not gonna be able to find a girlfriend or a, or a boyfriend or a husband or a wife. My kids are never gonna respect me. This is the time where you can really start forging those relationships prior to going into prison. You can start having the real talks with your friends and your family, your wife, your husband, your children, explaining to them the mistakes that you made that put you into this situation and explaining to them what you wanna see happen through your time in prison creating the roadmap of what you're going to talk about, how often you're going to communicate, what you plan on talking about. Once you get into prison and you start having these communication relationships with your family, your wife, your husband, you see many people that are in federal prison having conversations with their friends and family. And these conversations are so surface level that there's no growth. It becomes, how's the weather? Did you watch the game last night? There's no substance to it at all. So things you want to really focus on is making the conversation almost somewhat uncomfortable. Asking your family what struggles they're having right now because of you being in prison. Asking them truly how their day was and encouraging them to be open to you and tell you the truth. 
a lot of family and friends on the outside don't want to burden us inmates on the inside with these stresses or with these pressures because in their mind they think, well, there's nothing that Dan can do about it. He's sitting in prison or Dan's already going through enough dealing with prison, trying to get into RDAP, trying to find a way to shorten a sentence. The last thing I want to do is tell them I'm having problems paying the mortgage or our son or daughter got into trouble in school today. You want to encourage them to share whatever stressful vices they're dealing with is suppress and possibly get rid of any possibility of resentment that will grow. Encouraging that open dialogue is going to allow them to feel that even though you're not there, that you actually do care and that you're being a part of their life. And you might be able to become more involved in their life through this now than you were prior. You have the ability to do nothing but communicate through phone, email, and snail mail. You can't just walk in and say, hey, how are you doing? Or shoot a quick text message. So you really have to find the value and think about what it is you're going to talk about, especially if you're going to have visitations. Don't waste your visit in talking about bullshit or how good life is going to be after prison. Continue the dialogue. Stay here and now in the situation you're in and explain what you're doing, what progress you're making, and encourage them to open up to you and talk about what's going on in their life. This is what they need. Remember, there's not many people that